Uh, so uh, what we're talking about here um, uh, is the theme which I think uh, Amy finished with, which is what we call responsible AI. Um, and a little scene setting, uh, uh, it wouldn't go amiss. Obviously, there's a hell of a lot of good stuff that you can see coming out of AI, but there's also um, the odd thing that can seem a little alarming and the potential impacts on society are, of course, largely beneficial, but there are potential negatives. Um, and there's an emerging recognition uh, by society in general uh, that we need to do something about this. Um, we need some sensible guideposts for the responsible use of this transformative technology. Um, and when we talk about sensible guideposts, clear and enforceable limits, what we're talking about there is, um, well, laws really, uh, because laws and regulations are the embodiment by society of ethics. Um, currently, there is a bit of a risk that we'll end up with a bit of a legal vacuum here uh, because there are very, very few laws uh, at all that cover uh, the use of AI. The other dimension which is incredibly important if this is going to work is that any laws need to work on an international basis because AI is truly global. It works without recognising international borders. And of course, laws and regulations are mostly uh, limited to jurisdictions, limited to countries or small collections of countries. And it's critical that these legal guideposts for the responsible development of AI are developed now in the relative infancy of AI rather than later when it may be too late, uh, when consensus will have been lost. The pace of technological disruption is now so fast that many fear being left behind. So at this point, I should probably introduce myself a little bit more, but I'll keep it really brief. So I'm a technology lawyer, have been for um, over 30 years. I'm based in Leeds uh, with DAC Beechcroft. Um, I started off uh, at the end of the 80s, acting for the likes of Apple uh, from some mega law firm in the city of London. And then um, in the 90s, returned to my Yorkshire roots, and I spent the last 25 years supporting uh, all sorts of clients with contractual and regulatory risks in IT projects. And obviously, to do that, I've had to follow the evolution of the technology, and of course, that means in recent years, AI. Now, why is all this relevant? <laughs> well, in order to do this, um, I've uh, had to uh, get involved in um, uh, the uh, societies of lawyers that deal with these sorts of issues in different countries and the uh, main one on the uh, uh, on the planet is the International Technology Law Association which um, I've been involved in for over 25 years um, we've got over a thousand senior technology lawyers from 70 odd countries uh, and the idea is that we can pull resources and experiences uh, we learn from each other and on occasion we try to inform policy we try to take some of the stuff that we've learned uh, uh, to try and help regulators across the globe with the next generation of technology law so um, at this point um, uh, i'm going to try and change the slide um, a recent project we undertook was to review at a global level some of these legal issues emerging in AI, um, issues of complex societal importance. And usually what we come up with in our organisation is what we call a white paper. Um, but this one became a bit of a monster. It ended up being 300 pages um, and became more of a book, uh, which, uh, as you can see from the screen, had uh, quite a number of contributors. Um, I was a, a co-editor and co-author of this um, uh, and uh, it was a, a really ambitious project to bring together thinking from uh, such broad and diverse uh, jurisdictions. Um, so what we were trying to do was get some kind of worldwide consensus across the legal community and um, to try and deliver a framework, a level of guidance that could be given to regulators. Um, and we came up with these eight discussion principles. You don't need to read them, they're just there for uh, uh, illustration at this stage. Um, and we launched the book at our um, uh, annual uh, Congress in Boston last year. Um, and since then, we've had lots of 
um, uh, feedback. We've had a portal for people to contribute their thinking. Um, it, it had at its very heart several of the uh, tier one leading vendors and regulators. Uh, it was intended to be very practical. Um, and uh, just to give you one bit of feedback, seeing as we have the Microsoft uh, uh, person on, President of Microsoft wrote, wow, I wish I had done that. Congratulations to the entire team. It's amazing what you've done. And thankfully, he then placed an order for several hundred copies. Um, but I should stress that these days our first edition, which is being updated at the moment, I'm uh, very happy to give away for free in soft copy form. Uh, so I'm not here to sell a book. Um, now, enough about me, enough about um, uh, the background. Let's dive into uh, what we're actually here to talk about, which is what are uh, these eight principles? So I'm going to uh, canter through these, um, but please, just to be absolutely clear, there is a massive amount of detail about each of these in the book. Um, uh, and there's a little bit more detail actually on the slides, which I uh, skim over to some extent. Um, so number one, the mothership, ethical purpose and societal benefit. Um, the idea here is that uh, whilst we get into some more practical uh, principles in a moment, a central requirement once a decision is taken to implement a project involving AI is to decide, well, is it a good idea? What are its objectives and are they ethical? What are the societal impacts um, and are they beneficial? Uh, and I think that it's really important to remind people working in this area uh, that it's useful to do that. Um, uh, we, um, we find in society that there's a number of really uh, major areas where uh, mal maleficence, as they call it, uh, comes to the fore. Uh, because this was an international work, we use the Americanisms. Um, uh, but we found that um, the main areas we had to dip into were the ones listed uh, on the screen under societal benefit there. Um, uh, and when we talked to people like Google, IBM, Microsoft and so on, who were all doing their own ethical projects at the time, these were the areas that they were looking at. Um, so uh, the transformation of work, the environmental or ecological impact of AI, um, uh, weaponization of disinformation or fake news and uh, lethal autonomous weapon systems. And I think that last one's a really easy example uh, if you're trying to summarize something like this uh, quickly, uh, because everyone can pretty much agree that um, uh, lethal autonomous weapon systems are things that need to have human control and oversight. And we can't have um, uh, AI systems uh, being allowed to run free without that oversight. Uh, so a principle like that, most people will say, well, that's obvious. And that's kind of the point that there are certain obvious uh, areas uh, which just need to be agreed upon up front. Um, because whilst we might all agree that particular example is obvious, there might be some um, uh, uh, nutter out there who doesn't. Um, so that was our first principle. We're uh, moving now on to the first practical one, really, accountability, which um, is the big one in terms of uh, uh, legal uh, business. Uh, the principle really is that humans remain accountable for the acts and emissions of AI systems. Um, there are jurisdictions around the world that claim AI systems should be granted their own legal personality. Um, at least they're looking into it, um, but we had a good hard look at that and we we're not big fans of that. Humans need to remain behind AI. Uh, we can't guarantee the morality of our machines once they get to the point where uh, they're running free. Um, and we, whatever happens, in the same way that the law currently says that if you control a machine, you're responsible for what it does, um, we should have exactly the same principle enshrined in relation to AI. Um, now, we do also recognise that there'll be different responsibilities for the various stakeholders involved in the uh, development and deployment of AI. So uh, developers do need to do some level of assurance in relation to what they do, but they do need to be protected as well um, from uh, limitless claims. Uh, that's just not going to work. Um, equally, users will have a different level of accountability as to how uh, AI uh, is then deployed. And one of the things that we came up with, and those who are um, uh, unlucky enough to have to deal with GDPR in their daily lives will know this, uh, in the same way that in GDPR land, 
we have data privacy officers and data privacy impact assessments for certain AI projects, we think there should be um, AI impact assessments and for certain organizations, AI chief officers, just to make sure that corporate accountability is kept to the fore uh, and that someone is taking responsibility. Um, so that's number two. Number three, transparency and explainability, another one which I think Amy touched on briefly. Um, the use of AI should be transparent and decisions and outcomes of AI systems explainable. Uh, you might ask, well, what's the difference? Aren't they pretty much the same thing? Well, transparency is the uh, sharing of the details of the fact that AI is being used and basically where it's being used. Uh, explainability is how it's being used. Um, and uh, uh, as Amy said, we talk about black boxes um, and this graphic kind of illustrates uh, the principles uh, uh, there. Uh, what we're trying to do here um, it is ensure that in certain cases, black boxes are not um, used without some level of transparency and explainability. Um, but we're not proposing a one size fits all approach. It's got to be gradual and context sensitive. Um, you, you wouldn't expect the same level of transparency and explainability for systems that provide movie recommendations uh, to the ones that deal with criminal sentencing or refugee application uh, uh, systems. So um, we're cantering through them now. We're up to number four, fairness and non-discrimination. Um, another hot topic, and I think there's been an awful lot of uh, press activity over this one. Um, how do AI systems ensure that there is non-discrimination of their outcomes uh, and promote appropriate and effective measures to safeguard uh, fairness in AI use? So navigating this issue of fairness and predictive discrimination are really important in realizing the enormous benefits of AI. Um, this means considering the interlinking quality of data, the underlying socioeconomic context that comes with input into an AI system. If we introduce AI to assist in our decision making, for example, criminal sentencing, will that remove notions of bias or is the data that it relies upon already prejudiced uh, in some way? Um, and uh, I think that um, uh, we talk uh, in the book quite a lot about fairness by design um, uh, and the use of unbiased data, uh, ensuring that AI decision making models meet minimum data standards in terms of both their volume and their diversity to combat data driven bias and uh, the provision of explanations and a right to review for individuals who are subject to these AI decision making processes. And I'm going to uh, skim over that one. That one's a nice slide. It just shows how um, uh, auto translates uh, make assumptions that all nurses are female and all engineers are male, but that's just a, a, a little example there. Right, number five, safety and reliability. Um, clearly, uh, the use of AI needs to adopt design regimes and standards that ensure high safety and reliability. I think we could all agree with that. Um, whilst limiting the exposure of the developers and deployers, I think many of you could certainly agree with that as well. Um, so obviously safety is a core necessary design feature of any um, AI system uh, that has a, a technical operation. Unfortunately, we all know that this doesn't happen all the time, so we need to uh, have a level of uh, uh, rigor uh, around um, the regulation of safety in the same way that the law currently um, uh, uh, regulates safety in, in uh, all kinds of uh, machines. Uh, and, you know, the classic example everyone comes up with, of course, is the autonomous vehicle. And um, when they do so, they tend to touch on the so-called trolley problem. Um, this is where the AI system has to make the tragic choice between uh, two options, which could be arguably uh, equally bad. You know, uh, do you divert the car to hit the old lady uh, in order to miss the three young children, etc., uh, or is it the three old ladies and the one young child? Um, and so it goes on. Uh, in the book, we examine that. We also examine what we call elegant failure, which is how it is that AI systems linked to safety need to be designed and trained to anticipate failure. OK, so that's number five. And now we're on to number six, open data and fair competition. And um, 
this again is a very interesting one, um, uh, especially if you follow uh, the way in which Google and so on uh, use their data. Um, it was also uh, the one which we had the most controversial feedback on. So different lawyers from different backgrounds in different countries were coming up with very different views on what they thought the right answer was. Um, but where we get where we ended up was that we should open uh, access to data sets uh, which could be used in the development of AI systems uh, and open source frameworks uh, and software for AI systems. Um, the risk here is uh, that there will be the development and there probably is already the development of what we call a dataopoly. Um, large silos of data held by just one or a small number of businesses which enable them to develop market power. Um, in simple terms, um, the concern from a competition law perspective, because it is competition law that we're talking about here, uh, is that access to these data opolies or silos uh, may be restricted to large corporations in the same way as monopolies are created, um, preventing competition uh, and also creating uh, consumer uh, vulnerability. Um, so if uh, commercial decisions are taken by a business uh, which have the effect of exploiting their customers uh, making it difficult for other businesses to compete then even the existing law will protect you the question is how do we extend the existing law to cover ai um, uh, and so um, we think that there should be a restriction on data opolies arising um, let me just move on and um uh, secondly, on this one, we talk about open data. Uh, and again, I think Amy touched on this. Uh, what we're describing here is the concept of sharing uh, large data uh, lakes. Uh, one of the fundamental precepts of this principle is that sharing data, making it open, will have benefits in relation to improving AI, advancing research and making the development of technology more consistent and less siloed. So it's a bit like open access, a bit like open source. The principles are very much the same. And the little graphic on that slide gives you the virtuous circle of how everyone benefits from doing this. But as we all know from uh, open source, uh, not everyone's that keen on sharing. Um, number seven, privacy, uh, another hot topic. Um, so this one is that we should endeavour to ensure that our AI systems are compliant with the privacy norms and regulations. And uh, it will come as no surprise to you to learn that uh, across the uh, usage of artificial intelligence, um, uh, there are already massive amounts of um, data being uh, analysed and that across those large databases, the vast majority of them are populated with personal data. Uh, so uh, there's an obvious linkage there um, to data analytics organisations um, who are looking to monetize their investment on the back of uh, analysing personal data. Um, the question is, how do they do that without breaking uh, existing or future data privacy laws? Um, indeed, the GDPR already has in it. Uh, it's one of the rare pieces of existing legislation that refers to AI, already has in it a duty to disclose uh, when AI is being used in relation to some data processing. Um, so there's this inherent and developing conflict between, um, on the one hand, the increasing use of AI systems to manage personal data, and on the other hand, the increasing regulatory protection afforded internationally to personal data. Uh, because around the world at the moment, with every passing month, there's another country who's implementing another GDPR-like legislation. Uh, uh, at the same time, uh, across the globe, everyone's using more and more AI. Um, so uh, how do we uh, do this? Well, what we recommended was that um, uh, rather than come together in an almighty crash, which wouldn't benefit anyone, we need to try and encourage a, a parallel yin-yang existence between privacy regulation on the one hand and data-rich AI on the other for the benefit of uh, the individual. We need to find that balance and we come up with some ideas as to how best to do that. And clearly we mentioned, someone mentioned COVID just a moment ago. Clearly, that's one example uh, of where you do need to find that balance uh, when using the um, uh, apps for um, uh, uh, monitoring uh, personal movement and so on. Um, I shall now move on to our last principle, uh, AI and intellectual property. It comes last, uh, probably because it's not quite as crucial as the rest, but there is an important question here, uh, which is who owns 
IP and something created by AI. Um, the principle we came up with was basically uh, to recommend that AI systems developers do take the steps they need to protect their rights um, through the existing uh, intellectual property laws. Um, uh, because having looked at them, uh, we didn't really think that there was that much need for change in the existing IP laws. Um, they already have a concept of computer generated works, uh, which extends to AI. Um, so the fact that existing a IP law is reasonably well equipped uh, meant that we didn't uh, feel that, um, uh, that it needed to be changed. Just a little bit of clarification. Um, uh, and that uh, uh, image on screen um, was um, just a, an attempt to uh, paint a Rembrandt painting uh, simply by looking at other ones using AI. Um, uh, so uh, that's number eight. Um, so that that, that concludes the eight principles. I know I've cantered through them in the interest of trying to keep to time. Uh, so apologies for that. But again, if you want chapter and verse, um, uh, the soft copy is available. Uh, either send me an email and I'll send it to you or get in touch with the organisers uh, and maybe they can uh, help out. Um, at the beginning, we kind of um, uh, talked about whether uh, we could achieve some kind of global balance here. Um, the dialogue that we've had since we published the book with regulators such as um, in the UK, DCMS and the ICO, uh, the FCA and so on, um, uh, and across the globe, uh, uh, the new Californian GDPR um, was uh, one of the um, uh, uh, works which, what's well, called the CCPA, was one of the works that looked at our, uh, uh, our publication. Um, we're now trying to get that more and more um, enhanced and honed. And when the second edition comes out, we're hoping that we'll actually get the regulators to contribute. So there you are. Thank you very much for listening. I uh, now need to work out how I <laughs> how I switch this thing off. <laughs>